prayer time. Yeah. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us together today to dive into your word. Uh, please open up our hearts and our minds as we go into your word today and uh, convict our hearts um, as you need and allow us to gain understanding through your spirit and to uh, use Ralph to uh, handle the word accurately as he goes through tonight's study. We ask for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're going to kind of go through the process of confrontation and forgiveness and restoration. And um, the most important part of this whole message is really the third part, which is restoration and dealing with people in the body of Christ. And frankly, confrontation is also not something that's a skill that's practiced in the body of Christ in general, because confrontation generally, especially tough con confrontation, I'm talking about the kind of confrontation I'm talking about is when some one individual person will not accept someone confronting them. So you have to take it to the leadership. And the leadership in most churches do not practice um, bringing two or three witnesses to confront the person uh, because frankly, it's bad for business. You know, generally when you confront somebody and they don't repent, then you have to cut them off from the body of Christ and you're supposed to explain to the rest of the members why uh, they're being uh, cut off. And so since that is something that has come out of practice, uh, we, we have not learned how to exercise our muscles in dealing with honest relationships with people. So what happens is generally when people get hurt, they just leave the body of Christ is generally what happens. So let's talk about the basic foundation by which we work together in the body of Christ, how we start and why it's important that we, because of the basis of the relationship we're in as to why it can't be violated. Go to 1 John 1. And someone just read verses five through seven. Do you want me to read? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, five through seven. Mm -hmm. um, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to oh, bear I'm sorry. witness. I'm sorry. It's first John five. Oh, That's I'm it. sorry. First John five. <laughs> good. It's good. I was first John five. Wait, first John first one? John first John, first John one. one five through seven. Okay. Yeah, first yeah. John one one. Five seven. Okay. 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 This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness of all at, at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Okay, so the, the issue here is that just as God has no darkness in him at all, we're supposed to be in the light as he is in the light. And if there's any darkness that is to come up, obviously that has to be taken care of in the body of Christ. It's we're all children of light. So the point is we're walking in light and we're walking in practicing the truth and we don't lie to one another. That's the basis of our fellowship. Mm. Um, to go to Ephesians 4, it basically talks about this whole idea of speaking the truth in love. I had this discussion this week with some people about speaking the truth in love and read this passage, but it just starts Ephesians 4, just go through verse 11 through 16. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what Every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. 
Okay, so this being one of the most important passages of the New Testament, describing what the church is supposed to be, it really culminates and flows from being a mature believer, verse 13, which is in contrast with verse 14, being tossed here and there by waves and being unstable. When you have maturity, you're able to do verse 15, speak the truth in love. Which basically means, many people just think that means being nice, but actually speaking the truth in love means actually saying difficult things that people need to hear. Uh, and what has happened many times in the body of Christ, the people will say, well, that's not love. Uh, you know, reproof, for instance, is a form of love. Reproving people, correcting people is a form of love. And so this is the issue. Maturity speaks the truth in love. Yeah. Which is a reason, which I think is important too, because Ralph, I think you mentioned that it's a it's people end up just leaving the body. And I think there's two reasons why people leave the body in that instance. One, it's because they don't want to have the confrontation and it's easier just to bounce from church to church than have to actually address it. Or two, they do address it and it's not handled properly. And therefore they have to make a decision on whether or not they want to continue in the leadership of that local body and be submitted under that authority. So they have to make the decision to either reconcile with that or decide to go to another church, right? And I think that's because the lack of dealing with confrontation in the way, right? And and that's- Yeah, and you mean leaving the local church. Yeah, leaving the local church, yeah. You and, can't leave the body. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, leaving the local church. I mean, I think people who say uh, they left the faith because of that, it says, uh, Paul says, they never were of the faith to begin with, right? So I don't necessarily uh, see the same as saying, having confrontation with people in a local body and it not necessarily being handled the way that it should. And then you completely leaving Christianity because of the way that you were treated are two totally separate issues. Yeah. Go to Galatians 6.1. Um, it talks about what happens when an individual breaks fellowship with you or you break fellowship with them, um, what the process is. And someone just read Galatians 6.1 um, uh, verse all the way from one to four. Brethren, if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one to, in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so you will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something for when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each one must examine his own work. Then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another. For each one will bear his own load." Okay, so this seems fairly straightforward, but I've been in churches where someone was caught in a trespass by an individual. That individual told somebody else, which is gossip, and basically said, you know, you need to go and talk to them. So that's wrong because that's taking up an offense for somebody else. Scripture is very clear. We're not supposed to do that. So the person who's been offended or either offended by that person or has actually viewed the sin is the responsible party that's supposed to go. You don't go to the pastor with it. You don't go to another person with it. You as an individual go. And basically the, the, the goal is not that you're mad and not that you're offended, but that your goal is restoration, to restore them back. We're going to talk about what restoration means towards the end of the study. But restoring them to the place basically where they were before is, is the point. And, of course, it's supposed to be in the spirit of gentleness, each look at yourself lest you be tempted. So this is individual restoration. Now, if this doesn't work, uh, then, um, you know, Jesus talks about in Matthew 18 that you're supposed to take it before the church elder or to be to two, to two or three witnesses who are aware to, or to sit there and hear what the issue is and then decide if you know, they need to confront the person. And if they reject two or three witnesses, according to Jesus, you take it to the elders. And if they reject the elders, uh, they're to be excommunicated from the church is the process. Um, so generally that's how it works. Now, first Titus one talks about, uh, sins that are, that are committed against the body of Christ, not, it's not sins committed against one person, so there's a specific, there's a either harsher um, restoration process when the when things are done against the body, especially in relation to false teaching. So go to for, to Titus one, 
and read from verses 10 through 16. <clears throat> Back to you, Carissa. Okay, I'm sorry, Titus 1 what? 10 through 16. Three through sixteen. Ten. Titus one. Oh, ten. ten. Sorry, ten. I didn't hear the ten part. It's all right. Um, for there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced, since they are upsetting the whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said. Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Their testimony is always true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, uh, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commandments of people who turned away from the truth. To, pure, to the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Okay, so let me give some history here. Paul is talking about you think people who are not in leadership, right? But he's basically saying, but he says, he says here um, that the people that he's talking about especially those, verse 10, especially those of the circumcision, of the party of the circumcision. Who are the people who are who are of the party of the circumcision? Jews. Yeah. Go to Galatians. It explains who these people are. Go to Galatians chapter 2. He... And he, we're talking about Titus here. I'm just going to read this one. Where are you? Titus chapter 2, verse 1. And I want you to follow this narrative. Then after an interval of 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along also. Now, we were just in the book of Titus that Paul wrote to them, and he's talking about the party of the circumcision. And it was because of this revelation that I went up and I submitted to them the gospel, which I preach among the Gentiles, but I did so in private, to those who are in reputation for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. But not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. But it was because of the false brethren who sneaked in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ in order to bring us into bondage. But we did not yield in subjection to them for even an hour so that the truth of the gospel might remain with you. But from those who were of high reputation, big guys, big hitters, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Well, those were of the reputations contributed nothing to me. But on the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For he was effectually worked for Peter in his apostleship to the circumcised, effectively worked to me also to the Gentiles. And recognizing the grace that had been given to me, James and Cephas and John who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we might go to the Gentiles and they to be circumcised. They only asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was also eager to do. But when Cephas came to Antioch, this is Peter, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned for prior to his coming certain men from James, who was the head of the church in Jerusalem, he used to eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, if you being a Jew live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you are compelled, the Gentiles, to live like Jews? We are Jews by nature and not sinners among the Gentiles. I just wanted to point out that the party of the circumcision here is James. 
basically the head of the church in Jerusalem and a lot of the leaders from there. And that this was a massive... Uh, uh, is that James, Peter, and John? Yeah. No. James, Peter, and, and John were head of this party of the circumcision while Paul was head of the party of the uncircumcision. Yeah. Yeah. And Titus is telling him to deal with this severely. You need to try to restore them severely because this is an error that's being taught by the leadership. And so you're talking about severe treatment in this case because because it's it's an offense against the body of Christ and violates God's word which is a huge issue if it happens in leadership. And then I'm going to leave it right there. So okay, so the scripture is the main tool for restoration and when we're talking to people about their sin, we should be using the scripture. So 2 Timothy 3:16 is the basis of what all scripture is for. And it's funny, whenever I've talked to people about this, they're like, well, who are you to talk about this to me? And why are you quoting me scripture? And the answer is 2 Timothy 3.16. Somebody just read that. Verse 17 also. Um, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. This word equipped is the same word that's used by pastors equipping the saints in Ephesians. But notice that three out of four of the words that the scripture is used for are not comfortable. Training is uncomfortable. Being trained and disciple is uncomfortable. Reproof is uncomfortable. Correction is uncomfortable. So when people get offended by God's word being used, it says right here that three out of four of those are going to be bring some discomfort when God's word is used. So we have to really love God's word and understand that it, pri primarily it's his word that he uses to restore people in the body of Christ. The next one, what is restoration? We're going to leave to the end. But restoration, um, just for, for what we're talking about now, is just bringing back a person to the place that they were before. That's generally what we're talking about. And I've talked to people, I just talked to a brother the other day, who was felt guilt. He has been a Christian for 25 years. And he was talking about all his faults and things that he does wrong. Born again believer. Okay. Do we lose her? Yeah. He's back. Just continue. Okay. Hi. Sorry about that, guys. Where, where do we lose you? Um, yeah, you can just start your story. It was like it was like one minute ago. Okay. So I talked to this guy. He came in, he's 25 years in the Lord. And we were talking about his guilt and the sins that he has and how he needs to, he, you know, he has to do better. And I said, well, let me ask you something. When you do stuff wrong before God, you, you confess it. And he was like silent. And he says, well, no, I'm, I'm sorry about it. And I said, okay, well, go with me to 1 John 1, 9. Starting in verse um, 8. Or actually starting... In verse 7 through 9. Someone just read verse 7 through 9. First John 1, 9. 1, 7 1, through 7 9. 7 through 9. Oh, first John. 1, 7 through 9. Yeah, you're good. 7 um, through 9. Oh, but if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So what I said to him is, you can cleanse your life today and start new tomorrow. You don't have to have this shame. You just have to confess your sin. And confessing that sin... And forsaking it is the first point, first step towards restoration, is the first step. So when we recognize this in the process of repentance, the first step is, is to confess it. And the second set, st step is to turn from it. Uh, go to Psalm 51. This is the psalm that David wrote after he sinned with Bathsheba. Psalm 51. And just read verse um, 3 through 4 and then 17. Psalm 51, 3 through 4 and then verse 7. 
For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. I'm sorry, till what again? And then verse 17. Oh, verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you do not despise. Okay. So the, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, broken and contrite, clearly one hating the sin is a part of this process and asking for forgiveness. He says that to, 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 to you, God only have I sinned. So in this passage, if you were to read the whole thing, does he take care of his sin, all of his sin? Yeah. Okay. So who did he sin against? God. God. He sinned against God, but who else? And Bathsheba. He sinned against Bathsheba. Bathsheba is not mentioned in this passage. Against her husband. He he would have to go and confess to her what he did, since he was the perpetrator, and confess his sin to also to her. Mm. So I don't know that he actually did that, but he doesn't do it in this passage. So she, the, the offended, besides God, also has to be confessed to. Him. And, and to turn from that situation. Now, David ended up marrying her. So I'm not sure how that all worked out. Okay, but that's that's the requirement. So the contrite heart and a broken spirit, humility to God and those you offended. And he mentions here, only you, you know, my sin is against you, but he also offended Bathsheba. So that's an important part. Okay. So then you ask, so the, then there's the restoration process. So let's talk about that for a minute. You ask to be forgiven by your offenders in God. Go to Matthew 23, 5, 23. And getting the context. Verse 22. Go ahead through 24 Matthew 5 mm -hmm. but i said to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court whoever says to his brother you good for nothing shall be guilty before the supreme court whoever says you fool shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell therefore if you are presenting your offering at the altar and remember and there remember that your brother has something against you leave your offering there before the altar and go First be reconciled with your brother and then come and present your offering. Make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you are with him on the way so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and you be thrown in prison. One of the things that I liked about what the pastor presented when he presented communion last week was he went into great detail about examining ourselves and that we should have uh, our sin should be confessed and that we should not have anything before our brother or before other people and that we should have a clean slate we shouldn't be holding grudges or have issues with people in the body of christ uh and that therefore that all needs to be taken care of before we go to the altar or before we go to church or before we handle anything in a spiritual manner before before god uh, that we are in that case this is self-restoration this is a self-restoration process which means restoring ourselves to a place by taking care of and asking for forgiveness uh, for those that we have offended before God. So if you take a look at the idea of reconciliation, that word is dialoso, which means to go through, to change, to change through. And the word for restore means to, means literally former place. So, for instance, if you knock somebody's lamp off the table, restoration would be to completely restore that lamp to exactly its place that it was before. And if you couldn't do that, you would have to buy another lamp, frankly. But that would be the, the absolute process of that restoration, to restore them to the place where they were offended before. So if you actually sinned against somebody, the Old Testament concept of, rest, of restore was actually restitution. That is, you actually had to pay money to 
restore what it is that you broke if it was um, a, a, a financial matter. And if it's related to someone's reputation, you would have to restore whatever you did with their reputation to whoever it was that you maligned it with. So whatever you've done against that person, it would have to be, um, not only that person would have to ask for forgiveness, but they would also have to restore the situation, no matter what it was that they did to you and put you back in the place that you were completely restored prior to that event. That's what restoration means. That's why sorry, I'm sorry, is not appropriate. Because I'm sorry, uh, something you do when you bump into somebody in line, I'm sorry. But forgiveness and asking for forgiveness requires a lot more humility because the person you're asking for forgiveness for needs to say, I forgive you. And you're putting yourself in their hands to either forgive you or not forgive you. It's a question. If, if yeah. you say, I'm sorry, there is no question. Or there's no answer. It's an answer. It's a question and an answer. So in summary, the speaking of the truth and love starts from the beginning of one of us or falling out of light and going into darkness. And once we fall out of light, we are no longer in fellowship with light. And so therefore we have to go and seek that person out and talk to them. If it's a matter of them being in sin, we confront them with it. If they reject that by not receiving the truth, then we have to take two or three witnesses and if they reject the two or three witnesses, then we have to take them before the elders. And if, if the elders cannot bring them to that place, then they have to leave the church. From the standpoint of restoration, um, the idea is to restore them to the next place and also to make sure that the restoration takes place um, from the party that is sinning, that they also restore you. So not only are they being restored, but they're restoring you whom they offended back to the place that they need to be restored to, whether it's the stealing of their stuff or the stealing of their reputation, the maligning of their family, whatever it is, needs to be taken care of. Restoration on both parts. And then the final part is everyone needs to make sure that everything has been taken care of and that the restoration is complete, that the lamp has been completely restored and taken care of. Uh, and that there should be remorse on the part of the offender uh, in what they've done uh, to the other party. So those are all the issues in relation to um, confrontation, seeking uh, restoration, and then actually having complete reconciliation and full restoration on the bar part of all parties. Yeah. Can you touch on the, the idea of the first offense? I think that's really important in conflict. Yes. Um, so sometimes somebody will do something and say something mean, and then they'll say something like, um, and then they'll try and confront them about it. And they'll say, well, you, you know, you had a tone. So, um, so how do you deal with that? And the answer is whatever the first offense was, is what needs to be dealt with. So the first offender needs to take care of what it is that they did first. It's not what, what was piled on after. So if the first offender is able to handle the first offense, then it takes the pressure off the second offense right away. Uh, so we don't want to go and press on the second offense because it was the first offense that caused the problem. And so that's important. That's what, or, or it could go down to the third offense or the fourth offense or the fifth offense. I've seen people uh, refuse to forgive somebody based upon an argument of something that was said the next day rather than going back to unraveling what was what happened here and what was the first offense. So that's crucial in understanding these issues because all the rest of the offenses hap that happened after it are irrelevant. It's kind of like the, it's kind of like breaking into somebody's house uh, and finding evidence of something that they did. The court throws that out because the because you can't go and get evidence against something that somebody's done improperly. And that's what the second offense is about. And the third offense is about. The fourth offense is about. It's a, it's finding information to back up why you're not guilty. So that's why the first offense in every situation should be figured out first. And this should be taught in families that, hey, here's what the 
here's what the first offender needs to do. Mm. And then once the first offender uh, does that, you will find that the other offenses end up not being an issue. They fall away. That's been my experience anyway. Yeah. Mm. Great. Anyway, so that's it for tonight. Any thoughts? Now we can uh, stop the recording. Oh, well, can close in prayer. Yeah, close in prayer. Did, did we lose Carissa? No, no, oh, she's still there. Oh, there she is. Here. Sorry, it was on mute. <laughs> Hi. Well, thanks for coming on. Appreciate it. Uh, no, this was really good. Um, it just made me think about when we were taking communion last week. And I uh, was really rude with Kaylee on, I think it was before church, before I even left. I was just like really rude to her. And I was thinking about it when we were sitting in church and I had to call her and like ask for her forgiveness. Oh, okay. Awesome. So it was just making me think of that because, um, but you're right. It's, it's always sweet to like see those things and that the Lord presses those things upon our heart to you know, come to the table with a pure heart and um, confess sin. And so, yeah, it was good. Awesome. Definitely. Well, thank you. I'll close us in prayer then. Um, we're thankful, Father, for this time. We're just thankful for just what we have. Um, it's exciting just to want to dig into your word and find out what you want us to do. And we just thank you for that. Um, we pray that you would practice these things in our lives, even when it's hard, and that we would use your word uh, to clear things up. Uh, as they come up and that we would go to people with timidity and a heart of restoration when we talk to them. It's in Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.